There's the solar system that we all know and love. The sun, most important part. The four inner rocky worlds, the asteroid belt, uh, the four giant planets, and then Pluto doing whatever the heck Pluto does. And that was the picture that we had for decades from 1930, from the discovery of Pluto, all the way into the 1990s. But that's when everything changed. Because in the 1990s, we started to discover more and more objects in what we call the Kuiper Belt, which is like the asteroid belt, but colder and bigger and further away from the sun. But basically the same idea. It's, it's a bunch of junk left over from the formation of the solar system. And that's a pretty sensible picture. Rocky worlds, asteroid belt, giant planets, Kuiper belt. Ta-da, solar system. And then in 2003, we discovered Sedna. Sedna is a pretty big object, like half the size of Pluto, and it has the absolute most funkiest orbit you could ever possibly imagine. Like, if you thought Pluto's orbit was weird, Sedna's orbit is off the charts, okay? The closest it gets to the sun is something like 76 AU. The AU, that's astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the sun. So this is 76 times further away from the sun than the Earth is. That's the closest Sedna gets, all right? That itself is over twice as far away from the sun as Neptune, all right? And that's the closest. And the farthest Sedna gets, get this, is over 900 AU. So it goes from 76 AU to nine, over 900 AU. That is an extremely long ellipse. Sedna orbits, orbital period is like 11,000 years. And the reason Sedna is weird, in this orbit is particularly weird, is because Sedna is big. There's like a lot of stuff inside of Sedna. And it has this crazy long detached orbit. It like barely even knows the sun exists because it gets no closer than 76 AU. It barely even feels the sun. It doesn't feel Neptune. It doesn't feel any of the planets. It's essentially entirely, almost entirely detached from our solar system. How do you get a big object to be that detached from the solar system? Because Sedna didn't form like that. You, you don't form planets, as far as we know, with these crazy, weird, elliptical orbits that stretch like with these ridiculous amounts, hundreds of AU. Something had to put it there. Something had to force it to be there without making it ejected from the solar system altogether. That's why we think something funny is going on in the outer solar system. But that was the early 2000s. It was a crazy time. And there was just Sedna. And they were like, okay, Sedna's a weirdo. Maybe something funky is going on. Then over the course of the next decade or so, we discovered more and more of these what we call extreme trans-Neptunian objects, ETNOs. These are objects well past the orbit of Neptune. We found more and more, and we found some of them to have really strange orbits and really oddly coincidental orbits. In fact, there were six of these ETNOs, these e extreme trans-Neptunian objects, that had elliptical orbits, you know, okay, whatever, extremely elliptical orbits, okay, that's a little bit weird, and the ellipses were all kind of clustered nearby each other so that when these objects came close to the sun at their closest approach, which is still super far away, but, you know, close for them. When they came close to the sun, it was all in relatively the same point. Not at the same time, you know, there are different parts of their orbit, but their closest approach to the sun was in the, you know, the same little pocket of space. And that's odd. That's odd because... If you were to just randomly sample a bunch of orbits in the outer solar system, you wouldn't expect that six of these would be clustered like this. You'd think the ellipses would be, their orbits would be all over the place. But no, instead they're, they seem to be clustered. And the chances of this, like if this were just random chance or chance coincidence, oh, just 
you know, nature rolling the dice and we get these orbits was very, very low, like less than 1% chance that they would just randomly line up like this. Hence, the argument for Planet Nine. There has to be, as, as this argument goes, there has to be something out there, a large planet, like say five to ten times the mass of the Earth, and through its gravitational effects, it's shepherding these extreme trans-Neptunian objects to give them the clustering of that orbit. Because there's nothing, there's nothing else out there. These objects are so far away from the sun, so far away from the rest of the solar system that they don't even feel the effects of Neptune. So it's not like Neptune's gravity can do any shaping or sculpting out there. There has to be another massive object whose gravity is able to tweak and twist these orbits to get them to cluster up like this. Since that original argument for the existence of Planet Nine, there have been more evidence because uh, the people proposing the existence of Planet Nine run simulations. They like they build a solar system with the uh, trans-Neptunian objects, and they stick a Planet Nine in there with various orbits of various masses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, run the simulation just to see how the solar system shapes out. And they found that if Planet Nine exists and it's doing its thing, it will also tweak some other trans-Neptunian objects, some of these extreme objects, and actually make their orbits go perpendicular to the rest of the solar system. So we'll like kick them out and then put them on this weird orbit that goes perpendicular to everybody else. And what did we find a year or so later? A bunch of trans-Neptunian objects with perpendicular orbits as predicted by this theory. Does Planet Nine exist? Well, we honestly don't know. This is our only line of evidence is the behavior of these objects extremely distant from the sun. It is, as far as we know, the best explanation for the data. You know, if, if these extreme objects are not just randomly scattered. If there's something driving their orbits, the simplest explanation for the thing that drives their orbits is a planet five to times five to ten times the mass of the Earth orbiting the sun at some crazy extreme distance, like hundreds of AU away from the sun, which would explain why we haven't seen it yet, because it's very, very small compared to space and very, very far away from the sun, and so it's hard to spot. And so the search is on now to, to try to get it, to try to spot it, to try to take a picture of it, because without a picture, nobody's going to care, really. No one's getting a Nobel Prize based on some tweaked orbits of extreme Neptunian, trans-Neptunian objects. No, 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 we want a photograph, okay? Is a photograph coming? I don't know. We don't know if it's out there. There is certainly a dedicated group of astronomers that believe it's out there, but again, it's not for certain. It's it's just one of these things. In the claims were made a few years ago. We'll see where it goes, but it is pretty compelling evidence. There really is no other way or no other clean way to explain the orbits of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects. So I guess Planet Nine exists. It's worth a shot. Hope you enjoyed. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please go to patreon.com slash pmstutter. There's a link floating around my head right now where you can uh, help keep these episodes going. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next week.